you now, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to worshiping with you today. start our time off together by proclaiming these truths about our God, standing in confidence that he is our king. Come on. I wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it, but I can contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to keep the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I find. Our king is everything we need. 
He is solid. He is firm. He is the rock of our salvation. And the best thing we can do right now in this moment is worship Him and remind ourselves of the truth. Christ is my firm foundation. You sing it. Come on.
Our firm foundation is the finished work of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for our sin. And we're going to continue celebrating uh, that through the ordinance now of communion. So you can have a seat uh, where you're at as we continue in worship. And if you're new with us this morning, you do not have to be a member of our church to take communion this morning, but you must be a believer in Jesus Christ. Communion is a believer's meal. If you've never trusted in Christ, we praise God that he led you here this morning. Our prayer is that he would work in your heart, that he would draw you unto himself this morning, that you would trust in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior. For the first time, you can say you have an eternal foundation in him. And church family, every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, scripture says we're supposed to do this with great reverence and joy. Paul told the church in Corinth, examine your heart every time you approach the communion table. So we want to give you a few moments now for you to examine your heart. Let's shift our focus completely on the finished work of Christ. And after a few moments alone, I'll come back and I'll lead us through the bread and the cup together. Matthew's account is going to guide us this morning of when Jesus first instituted his communion with his disciples first. Scripture says in verse 26 of Matthew 26, that as they were eating Jesus, he took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Remembering it's by Christ's broken body on the cross that we can receive forgiveness of our sin. Let's take the bread together. And then in addition to the bread that represented his body, Verse 27 says, he then took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Remembering it's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. Let's drink the cup together. Father, we praise you this morning that as believers in Jesus Christ, we get to worship you in between the advents of our Savior, that the first advent has occurred. Jesus has come, and he has finished the job through his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. And while we live in that security, and communion reminds us of that, we also live with anticipation of his return. As he said with his disciples, that that one day we, we we will drink this cup with him, in heaven, in his Father's kingdom. And Lord, we long for that day. So until that day, we want to continue to worship you with all our hearts to to give you the praise that you deserve because of what we have experienced by faith in your Son. Let our worship, Lord, for the rest of this service be honoring to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, church.
Heavenly Father, wow, what a joy and honor it is to praise your name. We sing to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the name above all names. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It is only what he has done, nothing that we could have done to earn your grace, Lord. That while we were living in sin and once living in darkness, that Lord, the cross brings us from darkness to light. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can pull us out from the grave, Lord. And we just thank you for that. That Lord, death is dead and done. Life has overcome. So Lord, my prayer for us this morning is that we rejoice in that forgiveness, that we rejoice in that victory, we rejoice in that freedom, and that we rejoice in the eternal hope. That Father, whatever we came in here with this morning, whatever battles we are facing, challenges that we're facing in the world and in our lives, Lord, you are ruler above it all. There is no greater sacrifice than what your son has done. No greater act of love, Lord. So let us not forget that. Father, we love you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Church, it is so good as always to be worshiping to you this morning. Those who are in the room and those who are online, thank you for joining us. We're going to ask you to have a seat now and pay attention to the screens for the Bible Chapel update. I'm Allie. Hi, I'm Kyle. And whether you're in person or online, welcome. welcome. We're so glad you're joining us today. Here is what's happening at TVC. If you are newer to the Bible Chapel and you haven't already, be sure to stop by the Connect desk in the main lobby where our Connections team would love to welcome you with a sweet treat and a gift just for being here today. And for those of you joining us online, we'd love to meet you too. So if you haven't already, be sure to fill out a Connect card at biblechapel.org slash new. That's right. Part of worshiping God happens through giving, and we have two ways for you to give today. At the back of the worship center, there are bins available where you can drop off your giving, or you can give online at biblechapel.org slash give. Allie, Operation Christmas Child is in full swing across our campuses, mm -hmm. and we invite you to share the gift of Jesus with kids all over the world by packing a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child. Empty shoeboxes are available for pickup in the main lobby before and after services, or you can pack a shoebox online at biblechapel.org slash Christmas. Thank you for helping us demonstrate God's love in a tangible way to children in need around the world. That is so good. And speaking of the Christmas we season, love Christmas. we want to challenge you, our congregation, to invite a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, or a loved one to join us at the Bible Chapel as we celebrate the birth of our Savior this upcoming season. Starting this weekend, you can pick up our Christmas handouts in the main lobby. On there, you'll find information about our Light Up Night on November 30th and our weekend service information. We encourage you to share these handouts, whether you're handing out candy or you're visiting a friend at a coffee shop. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's continue with our service. stage. We've got um, around 175 guests. This is a night that we get to remind them that they are created in God's image. They're a child of God and we love them and we love that we get to celebrate them this night. Hanging out with this guy, becomes friends. People with disabilities, they, they love it here. And me too. The red carpet was fun, I loved it. Everybody clapped for me. The red carpet is uh, really great. I feel excited and happy. What makes the night so special to you? BBQ. <laughs> It's a really good blessing that I'm able to support all these lovely people and enjoy, enjoy the night. And get to know them on a more personal level and to get to have fun with them and see them smile and see them have fun is just 
That's what's stressing me. It's not just one night, it's, you know, all the time. We've made friends for life. We look forward to it every year. It's something that we enjoy doing, and honestly, we can't wait for, for the next one. We get to celebrate them and the gift that um, they are, and we are just so thankful to be able to share Jesus' love with them for a night. To the volunteers who make this happen every year, thank you. We can't do it without you. And I can't tell you how many lives you've impacted over the years, from parents to guests who are having the opportunity to maybe walk into a church for the first time in their life, and they get to feel the love of Jesus through you. And so we are just so thankful for you serving and you being the hands and feet of Christ. We're so thankful for all that God has done at Center Stage 2024, and we can't wait to see you next year. Yeah, we praise God for what he did on, on Center Stage, and it's the beauty of the church, right? When we work together, um, and, and my blessing was my role is to hang out with the parents of uh, or, or the family members who brought guests for, for Center Stage. And, and if, they're, if they're a first time here, they are blown away at the hospitality and love that, that, that their guests receive. Or, or they're returning. We had a couple of families. I mean, this is like their fourth or fifth year, and they said that they're, they're a family member with special needs that they brought. They, they talk about center stage not for weeks but months leading up to it. And we just thank you, you know, on the behalf of the church, you know, through your generosity, your giving, serving, we're able to do these types of things to not just bless them with an awesome night of fun, but Jesus is shared throughout. And we have a special needs ministry that goes throughout the year doing a ton of, ton of things to minister to, to that amazing community. So we ask you, you know, if you're moved by that video or you serve, serve all year. We, we could use a lot of support. And if you're, if you're interested in getting involved, special needs at BibleChapel.org. Jacqueline would love to talk with you about getting involved. Uh, one more thing. As we, again, we're, we're closing in on the election November 5th. I want to share what I hit last week. Just some resources and, and times to come together so we can, we can be in prayer in to hopefully help shepherd and guide you as we head to the voting booth. Uh, this past Wednesday dropped our episode on Lich Chat, our Bible Chapel podcast with myself and Joe Malarano. If you haven't listened to that, we encourage you to do so. That's there just to shepherd you, encourage you as we get ready for November 5th. And uh, we're going to spend a whole week in prayer together leading up to the election. So for seven days straight on our website, on social media, uh, we'll be posting prayers that I'm going to guide us in on subjects for us to come together and unite for a week straight leading up to the election. And then again on election day, uh, we're actually a polling center, but whether you vote here or not, Come to the church. We're going to have the worship center open all day. We'll have worship music on. We'll have folks floating if you would like prayer. And just come here and pray as we pray for our country. All right, let's pray now as we prepare our hearts to transition to God's word. Father, we come before you and, Lord, I, I just praise you for, the, for this church. I, I praise you for my brothers and sisters in the room and online, Lord. Uh, whether it's a center stage or, or, or what's going on in our, our community or right now, you know, those serving in our chapel kids and the many areas that we're blessed uh, to, to serve and do life together, I just praise you for my brothers and sisters who are all in here at the Bible Chapel to develop followers of Christ. And Father, we now want to worship you through the hearing and then application of your word. So Father, I pray we would lick go of any distractions right now, focus on you, and Lord, teach us as only you can. Please, Lord, let the words that come out of my mouth right now and the meditations of my heart be honoring and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 3 as we continue this amazing study of James's letter. Last week, we looked at the first half of chapter 3, a powerful passage on the tongue. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and watch that. We discussed both the nature of the tongue and how believers can experience the transformation of their tongue, their speech, their words in Christ. Now, coming off that powerful section on the tongue, on the back end of chapter 3, James distinguishes Christians who are operating with God's wisdom, what he refers to as wisdom from above, compared to those who find themselves operating with the wisdom of the flesh, their sin nature, 
and influenced by the wisdom of this world under the influence of Satan. As he did with, with the tongue, he's building off a subject that he briefly hit in chapter 1. In chapter 1, he, he stated that God is graciously generous with his wisdom to his children if we will humbly and confidently seek him for his wisdom. And in connection to chapter 3 on the tongue, he's also continuing to distinguish teachers who are truly teaching God's wisdom compared to those who are teaching a false wisdom driven by human passion or selfish motive. Remember, James 3.1 started with this. When, when James says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. This was in response to unqualified teachers trying to have a voice in these early Jewish Christian communities. We said last week, man, th that should send a shockwave to every believer who has the honor of teaching God's word. Whether you're the pastor on the stage or you're the small group leader, you, you lead a Bible study, you teach our second grade chapel kids, tonight you'll lead a student small group. Whatever influence you have, we will give an account before Christ of whether we were faithful or not in the handling of his word. So with that context, James in verses 13 through 18 drives home this. Christians operating with wisdom from above what? what? What do we know about them? What will we notice if we were operating with wisdom from above? We're gonna break down a lot of the individual words in these six verses because they're, they're rich, they're heavy. Most of them are actually unique to James. They only appear here in scripture. So let's prepare our hearts to hear from God regarding his wisdom. Starting in verse 13. James transitions from the tongue with a question. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James opens up this section asking these Jewish believers, all right, all of you, who among you are truly wise and understanding? These two words go together. Uh, the Greek word for wise here is the adjective sophos, which appears 13 times in the New Testament. It, it represents a believer who has a, an extensive knowledge of God's word and a level of spiritual discernment. And then the word understanding, this is one of those unique words that only appears uh, here in Scripture with James, in James chapter 3, and it means this. It's the Greek word apistemon, which means one who is known by the effectual ability to exercise that knowledge. And James begins to answer his own question by stating those who are truly wise and understanding regarding God's wisdom are those whom he says operate in their conduct with meekness before God. What he's saying is the truly wise believer is the one who does not have to tell all his brothers and sisters how smart he is. Their daily humble obedience before God, the consistent Humble obedience reveals they are truly wise in understanding regarding the wisdom that comes from God. Now, he's going to flesh that out even more in verses 17 and 18, but, but he first shares in verses 14 through 16 the opposite kind of wisdom. And in these three verses, he uses a phrase twice. He says, those operating with wisdom that's not of God are often driven in the church 
by jealousy and selfish ambition of others, probably related to James 3.1, these unqualified teachers who just wanted the platform. The word jealousy here, it actually appears 20 times in Scripture. Half of the occurrences, nine of them, is positive. It represents like a healthy zeal and passion for God. But the other 11 occurrences are negative, such as right here. It's the word zelos, which means to have jealousy, greed, pride, where, where a believer longs for something that actually belongs to another. Same exact word was used for the high priests and Sadducees who could not take all the attention that the apostles were receiving from the crowds in Jerusalem. Acts 5, 17, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, same word, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. And, and he says, in addition to jealousy, this wisdom from the world, not of God, also is is driven by selfish ambition. The word appears seven times in the New Testament. It, it's ambition focused on self-interest alone. Paul told the church in Philippi, don't operate this way. Chapter two, verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition. Same word, or conceit, but in humility within the body of Christ, count others more significant than yourselves. Again, going back to those unqualified teachers in, in verse one, this is one who wants to appear smart, show off their wisdom, but really all they want is a voice and influence in the church driven mainly by selfish ambition and interests. He, he says that kind of wisdom is ultimately not a wisdom representing what God desires from his people. And then he gives three striking words to sum this up. He says that wisdom is earthly not from above. It's unspiritual, meaning it's part of this finite, sinful, natural world, the flesh. And then he says, that wisdom is demonic. Man, imagine hearing that from someone reading this letter. Demonic? This is the only place, another unique word for James, this is the only place this word is found in Scripture. It doesn't represent a person who is possessed by a demon, but it represents the person who is operating according to the wisdom of the fallen spirits of this world who are actively living in rebellion to God under the influence ultimately of Satan who is called in scripture the prince and ruler of this world system. So the question is, wait, wait, wait. can a believer actually at times operate with a wisdom that is more earthly, unspiritual, and even demonic? Peter did. Matthew chapter 16, when, when Jesus said, hey, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna rise on the third day, and Peter said, no, you're not, Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, and Peter took him, Christ, aside, and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. Here's the difference. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, wisdom from above, but on the things of man, the, the wisdom of man, sin nature, under the influence of Satan, the prince of this world. Man, man James remarks in verses 14 through 16, should cause every believer to check their heart on not only what type of wisdom I operate in, but what's my motive to appear wise or, or to have influence in the body of Christ. You know, do I think I'm wise before God just because I've been going to church for 40 years or because I have a lot of verses memorized in my head? But yet, if you look at my daily conduct, does it represent humble, consistent obedience? What's my ultimate motive and desire? To serve in the church or have influence in the church? Is it humble obedience to use my gifts? Or if I'm honest, there's a form of self-interest, selfish ambition, or, or even I'm jealous of my brother and sister and I want that role that they have. And then ask ourselves, you know, throughout the week, am I putting in my mind and my heart wisdom from above? Or am I more putting in my mind and my heart 
the wisdom of this world. Remember, Jesus said, we covered this last week, what you put in your heart will come out. What, what kind of shows did I watch this week? What kind of wisdom is that instilling in me? What type of conduct, content did I consume on social media and YouTube this week? What, what type of music did I listen to this week? How much political news did I watch this week? What type of company do I surround myself? Students, what type of company dominates who I surround myself with on a consistent basis? How much of that is putting a different wisdom in my life more than the wisdom from above? And James says in these two verses, church, when we operate in this manner, we're operating, he says, in a falsehood of truth. Like, like we have the truth, we know the truth, and we think we're operating in the truth but we're really not. And he says, don't be surprised in the body of Christ if you let the wisdom of this world dominate your community. At some point, disorder is going to happen. And literally, every vile practice could even show up in the church. All right. None of us want that, right, at the Bible chapel. That's not our desire. So help us, James. How do we know that we're operating with the wisdom of God? Well, we're going to break down all these words. He packs it in there in these two verses. First, James says, wisdom from above is first pure. This word appears a little more than a handful of times in the New Testament. At Sometimes this word is used as a challenge for believers to approach God with a contrite, pure heart and repentance. And it's often used in Scripture to describe who God is. Who Christ is. He's the only true faultless one. That's what this word means, to be faultless. And to describe God's word. 1 John 3.3, 3, John used this word when he said, And everyone who thus hopes in him, Christ, purifies himself. Why? Because Jesus alone is pure. So for me, it starts right here that we often see in Scripture. Christians operating with wisdom from above. Fill their hearts and minds with the perfect word of God. We beat this drum every week because it keeps showing up in Scripture. We need to get the junk in our lives that's been filling up our hearts and minds with the false wisdom of the world. And we need to saturate on a daily basis our minds and our hearts with the divinely authoritative, inerrant, perfect Word of the living God. Scripture says many times, specifically in Proverbs, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Why does it say that? That word fear means a reverence of God. That I can say I revere God all I want, but if I spend little bit of time in his word each week, I don't revere God. You can think you do, we can say we do, but a reverence of God means I can't operate without you. More than revering Sports Center every morning or, or political news every morning or my favorite even podcast of my favorite preachers, I can't help but be in God's word every day because I truly fear him and need him and rely on him. You can't do it. You cannot operate with the wisdom of God. If God's word is not a number one priority in your life every single day. And in context of James 3.1, it's also a reminder. It was a calling out again to these, these uh, unqualified teachers. Today, watch out. Watch out for the person, whether it's on stage or the podcast or whoever it is, who, who, who loves to use the phrase, God gave me this revelation I want to share with you. And then they don't go directly to the perfect revealed word of God because they're probably then going to share their wisdom. Or they take a verse completely out of context and then the rest of their message really has nothing to do with Scripture. Pure wisdom, first and foremost, begins and ends with do I revere and prioritize God's word in my life? If God's word is only coming to you for about 30 to 35 minutes on a Sunday, that's not going to cut it to operate with the wisdom of God. All right, the second 
Greek word that he uses here is the word for peaceable. This word actually represents wholeness. It represents well-being. It represents a believer that has a harmonious relationship with someone or something. It only appears twice in Scripture, here in James 3 and in Hebrews 12, 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit, same word, of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In context here, representing the discipline we go through as children of God, times it feels painful, but it's producing in us this peaceful fruit of righteousness. We're becoming more whole in Christ. So here, here's the second indicator. If we're operating with the wisdom from above, we will begin to live whole, not fragmented lives for Jesus. This goes back to what James shared in chapter 3. How can spring and salt water come out of your mouth? How can I speak one way at school or at work, in the community, and then I just all of a sudden become holy in my speech when I get the small group or I become in church? This wholeness represents the believer where, where it's not like, God, you can have these areas of my life because I'm cool with that, but this stuff is for me. Or... If I'm honest, this area, I'm operating more according to man and the world than God. It's the believer who says, honey, we're going to do marriage God's way. Let's open up the scriptures. Let's do a checkpoint. Are we operating God's way in our marriage? Parenting God's way. How I structure my kids' schedule and what they're doing and how they spend their time, God's way. How I approach my career, how I approach school, God's way. How I approach my finances and resources. At the end of the day, Scripture says it's all from him, God's way. How I approach my conduct and participation in the church. My motive to serve, to be involved, God's way. This is a, a heads up connecting to that for 2025. We're going to kick off next year with a series called All In, that we can look through Scripture together. Because I believe, I believe all of us want to be an all-in church at the Bible Chapel. All in together. Not 50%, all in together. What does that look like in order to be the local church that God calls us to be? All right. Coming off that one, I'm going to combine two characteristics here because the next two go together. First, he says, wisdom from above is gentle. This word appears five times in Scripture, uh, often in comparison to a quarrelsome believer, because it represents a believer who has a soft heart, a lenient heart towards others. Titus 3.2, speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling, opposite of that, to be gentle, same word. And to show perfect courtesy toward all people. And then open to reason, that, that's one word in the Greek, again, unique to James here. This is the only place in Scripture it appears. And connected to the meekness he hit in verse 13, this represents the believer who, who's not closed-minded or a prideful know-it-all where they think, I can't really learn anything from everyone else. I've arrived as a Christian. This, these two land us on this. Christians operating with wisdom from above are humbly approachable and teachable. They're the one who, who are known in the body of Christ that if I have sin in my life or I need an area to grow, I'm going to that brother or sister because I know they have a caring and lenient heart, meaning they're approachable. They won't judge me, but they're going to walk through this situation with me. I want to go to them. But it's on the other side, too. You're approachable when you're known as one that when there is sin in your life and your brother or sister addresses it with you, you're not immediately defensive. You are open to constructive criticism, understanding we all have room to grow together. And connected to that is this open to reason, meaning you're a teachable Christian, you don't always think that you're the smartest believer in the room. You actually understand the spirit of God lives in my brothers and sisters, so he might want to work through them for my development. 
You don't always have to dominate the small group discussion. You don't always have to have all the answers. And there is no serving role in the church that is too far below your standards. I'll be honest, I struggle at times with that. This is the first time in 12 years of being in some form of men's group every year where I'm not either the leader or co-leader of that men's group. I'm just one of the guys sitting under two godly men. Initially, that was not easy to take on. But I'm telling you what, I'm loving it, loving it. I don't have to prepare as many lessons. That's not just because of that. <laughs> I'm loving it because, man, these, these men are taking it so serious. And I'm already learning a lot. Man, and it's refreshing just to be one of the guys. Next, James combined the attributes of mercy and good fruits. Interesting, you know, how do these go together? Well, well, let's unpack them. Mercy here is the same word that Jesus used when the Pharisees were saying, yeah, you're the son of God, you're eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 13, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, not, not ritual religion. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Mercy is the demonstration of compassion towards an offender who deserves judgment. And it all begins and ends with the compassion that God has shown us who are offenders towards him in our sin and who deserve death. As Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which with which he loved us, even we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. And then the exact word that he uses here for good fruits, uh, that word fruit is actually the same word he uses in verse 18 for harvest, harvest of righteousness. And when we see this word in Scripture, it's always connected to righteousness. Philippians 1.11, be filled with the fruit, same word, of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It describes the believer who's continuing to become more in line with the righteousness of Christ in their behavior by modeling him. So here's the next one. Christians operating with wisdom from above demonstrate consistently the mercy and righteousness of Christ to all. Let's start here in the Bible chapel of the church. The tense culture and time of our nation so easily can create tense moments in the body of Christ. And I'll be honest with you, on a weekly basis, I'm either directly involved or indirectly involved in a situation with brothers and sisters whom have a conflict and it elevated so quickly because we rushed to judgment on my brother and sister before even having a true sit-down conversation. And rushed to judgment without first saying, how can I show mercy here? We don't let sin slide, but, but how can I approach this moment with mercy towards my brother or sister? And then we think about more than anything, as Jesus said, he came to call the sinner, not the righteous. Man, this election season, does God want us to simply go on social media and bash unbelievers who are dead in their sin? What would you expect from someone who doesn't have the spirit of the living God in them? Instead, through intentional mercy undeserved favor and love, our goal in this season is not to solely win them over to our political candidate. Our goal is to win them over to Jesus Christ. And that comes by demonstrating the mercy of Jesus towards them and the righteousness of Christ to them. Your actions and words look so different than the unbelievers in their life. And, and you seem to operate with a joy, a peace, and a hope that's not of this world. Tell me where you get that. And we get to point them to our Savior. All right. 
James closes out, verse 17, you could have did a whole sermon series on this verse, right? He closes out this verse with a combination of two words, impartial and sincere. Again, James, he, he wants to be unique in, in this verse. Uh, this word for impartial only appears here in all of Scripture, representing one in the body who is non-divisive. And sincere represents the believer who is without hypocrisy, the theme of this series, who is genuine in their faith. Paul used that word for uh, sincerity in Romans 12, 9, and 10 when he told the believers in Rome, let your love be genuine, same word. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. And I love this statement. Outdo one another in showing honor. Not outdo one another who knows the most Bible verses, are in the most Bible studies, has the highest level of ranking serving in my ministry. No, outdo one another of who can honor one another the best. Then finally in verse 18, the, the word sown here represents something a believer intentionally cultivates in the body of Christ. And he says, man, those operating with wisdom from the above are those who, who plant, water, nurture, protect our bond of peace in Christ. Paul loved this word. He used it almost 40 times in his letters because he knew within the messiness of the church, the enemy wants to divide us, and he said, seek peace. Seek peace, church. Seek peace. Romans 14, 19, so let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Ephesians 4, 3, my brothers and sisters, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Again, peace is not the absence of conflict or that we shouldn't biblically address sin in the body of Christ. But, but when we do, the aim is to not put my brother and sister in their place or to show how righteous I am. The, gain, the, the, the goal is reconciliation in peace, to bring peace and wholeness in our relationship, which will bring peace to the greater body. When I look at these final three listed by James, I come back to my prayer of what we're trying to do here at the Bible Chapel, which is this. Christians operating with wisdom from above foster unity, authenticity, and peace in the body of Christ. It's every believer at the Bible Chapel following the desire of Christ in his prayer of John 17 who said, the world will know that you have sent me, Father, when they are one as we are one. So we walk in this place, even in the hard moments and messiness of church, always for the unity of the body. We're authentic. We're not fake with one another. We're sincere. And by doing that, though, we're not trying to put our brothers and sisters in their place. We want to be a safe place where my brother knows in that men's group, my, my sister knows in that women's group, they can bring their sin and they're going to find the mercy and grace and love in a place where they can be real so we can restore them back in Christ. And that goes to the word peace. Man, we want to be a place where in the midst of the messiness of church, we together always strive for peace in this place. And you know what's the beauty is? I encourage you, we covered a lot, right? In your sermon notes, all five of these statements are there. Go through them this week. Examine your heart. But what I love about this is it all comes back to the gospel. All of these points come right back to the gospel. Starting with peace. Because at the end of the day, we can only have peace in this place because of the peace we have with God because of Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1, Paul said, therefore, since we have been justified, declared not guilty of our sin, by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's my motivation every day to commit myself to filling my mind and heart with the word of God? The gospel. That was just the beginning of my walk with Jesus when I trusted in him as my Lord and my Savior. And there's no greater relationship in my life that I want to nurture than my relationship with him. In response to the gospel, I can't help but be in his word. What's my motivation? To give him my whole life, not a fragment of life, because he gave his whole life for me, literally stretched out on the cross. How can I not respond by giving not just three quarters, but my whole life back to him? Why am I in humility approachable and teachable? Was there any greater display of humility than what Paul said in Philippians 2, that he was 
in humility, obedient, even to death on the cross. I want to model that with my brothers and sisters. Why should I demonstrate mercy to all? God, every day in my sin, extends mercy to me. Why do I want to model the righteousness of Christ? Because I'm not following any celebrity. I'm following the King of Kings. He's my model for life. And I know in response to the gospel, the best way the Bible chapel can advance the good news of Jesus Christ is if I foster unity, authenticity, and peace in this place. Going back to the gospel, I love the lyrics of this familiar song we're going to end with. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice calling out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. And then going back to trusting in my wisdom or God's. I will not boast in anything, no gifts of mine, no power of mine, no wisdom of mine, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection.
So our oldest, uh, Ezra, he turned 11 on, on Friday, and it, it's a sweet season with our son. Specifically, uh, often instead of his dad saying, are you in the Word? Are you reading the Word for yourself? Just the past few months, I would come downstairs. He's our early bird, and I find my son with his Bible, right? No greater joy. But I love how kids are honest. He says, Dad, sometimes I don't want to read the Bible in the morning. And I said, Ez, join the club. We've all been there. And that's part of our, our growth. And I've been trying to communicate to him the reason why. So we were driving home yesterday from Upward. It was the last, uh, the last game of the season. I coached his younger brother. I've coached him. And he said, you know, on the way home, Dad, thanks for always coaching us and, and always want to be with, with us all the time. And I said, Ez, that's it. And he said, what's it? I said, you asked, you know, why, why do I need to be in God's word? You know, why is it important? I said, would you want me as your dad to only be interested in like 50% of your life, 75% of your life? He's like, no. God's the same way with us. We, we read his word. We worship him. We seek him because we have a God who loves us so much. He says, my child, I don't want just 50% of you. I don't want three quarters of you. I want all of you. He cares about every moment of our day. So everything we talked about in James 3 is not some burdensome legalistic stuff. It's a treasure that our God, as we just sang, has such a deep love of us that he wants all of us. If you could use prayer after service, we'll have a team up front who would love to pray with you. Father, we come before you. We praise you for who you are. God, I'm thankful that uh, as followers of you, the, the greatest weight of this life, our sin has been finished by the finished work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we, we get to operate and follow you in freedom. And God, what a blessing that you're a God who has given us your word so we can know you, we can follow you, we can seek you and walk in your wisdom, that you're a God who, who loves us so much that he says, my son, my daughter, I want all of you, not part of you, I want all of you. Gives us this, the body of Christ, where we can be approachable and teachable and, and humble before one another and have the greatest community on the face of the earth. A God who showed us such mercy. And when we trusted in Jesus, you gave us his righteousness that he says, now go, my children, show mercy to one another in this world. Proclaim my son and represent his righteousness to all. And God, we pray in response to that gospel that in this place at the Bible Chapel, we won't be perfect, but we will strive for unity, authenticity, and peace all in response to the gospel. And Lord, if there's a person right now at the hearing of my voice who has never trusted in Jesus Christ alone as their Lord and Savior, God, break hope in their heart. Let them experience for the first time the unending love of their, of their God and of their Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we would trust not in themselves, but in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins. Father, we're gonna leave this place in that unity that we learned from your word today. 